Okay. Uh, for those of you who may have just joined the stream, this is the Captain Planet Bravo deck. It's a deck that was created by my guest here, Matt. He won a uh, he won a recent tournament with it that was shown on stream at a store called, I believe, Out of the Box Games in Thomasville, North Carolina, and it attracted a lot of buzz in the community. I figured I would bring him on and have him showcase what was going on with his build and what the reasoning was behind it. So, Matt, uh, without further ado. Uh, why did you uh, why did you build this deck? Well, first I I love the guy in the Twitch chat that's saying I bowled a perfect game. That's that's awesome. Um, I just uh, wanted to throw together a Bravo deck that was different than what everyone else was doing. Um, I had a testing group put together a couple lists. They were all um, playing like a traditional guardian plan and they were all just enamored by the card pulverize so that card i think started leading people in directions of making you know bravo the showstopper list but i took it in a completely opposite direction the uh where the deck fuses as much as possible in my initial testing you know i was fusing i, I think i goldfished 10 hands and I uh, fused with the deck 8 out of 10 times. Pretty impressive. Yeah, I don't think it, it actually will fuse that often. But, you know, in, in the initial testing, I was just amazed. And I started to see some play patterns with the deck. How easy the deck was to play and how fast it could kill an opponent. And then, you know, when once you start throwing in cards like Oak and Old and Crippling Crush and Frostfang, you realize how disruptive the deck is. So you're dealing damage to them, and they uh, can't play their game plan. That seems like a pretty good state to be in if you're, uh, if you're throwing out a bunch of damage, disrupting the opponent, and just coming in with all these dangerous attacks from Bravo Star of the Show's ability here. So... As as Mike Sorry, Tyson go ahead. Says, uh, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> yeah, that's a uh, that's, that's what an old... that's what this uh, Bravo's doing, right? He's he's very disruptive and he's just punching in, in the a face. Ton of damage. Yeah, so this uh, this ability you have to reveal an Earth, an Ice, and a Lightning card in order to trigger the ability. And one of the first things that you note when you look at this deck broken down like this is there is a lot of Earth, a lot of Lightning, and a lot of Ice relative to some of these compositions. And there's not a lot of stuff that is non-elemental. Yeah, yeah. The um, the main board of this deck. I have a sixty card aggro main board. We're looking at eighteen Earth. 17 lightning, uh, 17 ice, and three pulses. So it's fusing quite often. And with crown, you're seeing a fifth card every turn. So, you know, your your fuse rate is probably in the 60% range every turn. Yeah, I think I uh, I think I looked at some calculations, and I think it's. Um... I think it's pretty good. I think it's something. I think it's sixty something percent, maybe, if you're using the crown. Um, and if you use Art of War, I think it goes up further. But that's like becomes kind of complicated. Also, in some situations, you can keep a pulse in hand. Not always the best thing to do, but in some situations, you can. And then that's of course going to increase your fuse rate for your next hand because you know you already have two of the three things you need. But uh, yeah, this Crown of Seeds, I think, is actually one of the most important cards for the deck. Also, one of my favorite pieces of art in Flesh and Blood. So once per turn instant, one resource, put a face-down card from your arsenal on the bottom of your deck, draw a card, and prevent the next one damage that would be dealt to your hero this turn. Uh, this is a very strong card. This is a... Um, and so first off, it's going to provide some damage reduction. Second off, it synergizes well with the Rampart of the Ram's Head and with Null Rune equipment. Um, because you can like pitch a blue, spend one to activate Crown of Seeds, and then have two floating with which to use the Rampart of the Ram's Head and other abilities that uh, cost resources on your opponent's turn. But additionally, the fact that you go from having a card in your arsenal to having another card in your hand puts you in a better position to be using Bravo's ability. And often you might be like, oh, I have two of the three pieces of the so the like so-called Captain Planet fusion or whatever, and by using the crown of seeds i can try to fish for that third one and that that happens quite a bit and it really helps the deck become more consistent yeah prevents a ton of damage too i mean you're preventing five ten damage a game with with just that card 
throw yeah, the it, shield throw the shield on top of that, you know you're you're really looking at ten plus. It it's a lot of damage you're preventing with those two cards. Yeah, especially against opponents that are going to be doing an attack pattern that breaks the combat chain, in which case you're going to be able to potentially use the shield multiple times, even if you only pay for it once. If it gets one block until end of turn and the opponent keeps breaking the combat chain, you can keep throwing the shield out in front of them. And additionally, there's a pair of iron hide legs here, where if you pitch that blue, spend one on the shield, one on the crown, you might have one floating, and if you need to, you can spend that one to throw the iron hide legs out there and block for an additional two. So it's yeah. a pretty sweet, uh, pretty sweet defensive style there, where just pitching a blue can actually get you a lot of defense in the right circumstances. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the um, let's talk about the different colors. One of the things that I was impressed by that I don't think it's obvious at this level of zoom, but if you look at the earth cards, there's going to be, you know, like these evergreens, we have them in, we have evergreen red, we have autumn's touch red, we have autumn's touch yellow. There are some earth blues. So the break ground is blue. There's a blue evergreen and a blue autumn's touch, but there are also more of the like big attacks from earth that cost three and work with Bravo's ability. But then when you look at the other colors uh, or the other elements, the color balance is a little different. So when you look at lightning, almost all these lightning cards are actually blues. In fact, the only one that's not is the red lightning surge. And when you look at ice, again, it's going to be almost all blues. We have the blizzard ice encounter. There's this frost fang red, but the other ice cards are all blues. So can you tell us, Matt, about the uh, the way that the different uh the way that the different pitch uh, pitches work with this deck strategy yeah so there's a common play pattern with this deck right so your hero is encouraging you to play three calls attacks so you want to have a ton of blues in the deck so the common play pattern is pitch a blue lightning card play a earth card follow that up with a um, blue pitch ice card attack with the hammer right yeah this is and that, your bread and butter turn that you want to take every turn. Yeah, so this uh, Winter's Whale here coming in for four damage. Uh, you can pitch for three with any color of card. So if you have to pitch an Earth card or whatever you can, but if you pitch an Ice card, it creates that on-hit effect where if this hits a hero, it creates a Frostbite token under their control. I don't have the Frostbite token uh, out here on display, but basically the way that it works is that it makes the next thing that your opponent's going to do cost one more. And it goes away at the end of their turn if they don't do anything, which does happen with this deck sometimes if you just hit somebody really hard and they just put a card in Arsenal or whatever. But the um, it's an, another way to kind of impede what your opponent has coming back at you. Exactly, yeah. It's part of the whole disruptive package here. You know, one Frostbite can uh, really mess up an opponent's turn. Yeah, especially if you see the... Um, you know, like the that was one of the big weaknesses I think of the so-called uh, Cheerios Briar, the zero-cost Briar deck that actually did really well during the national season. One of the weaknesses to it was uh, that it had uh, was ice effects because that deck was so heavily focused on playing zero-cost cards and had such minimal pitch that even the one extra resource from a frostbite, you know, that might be four less attack coming at you because they had to pitch some some you know zero for four red that they were otherwise going to play to swing. All right, so why, uh, who do you think, uh, Matt, who do you think this style of deck is good for? Uh, I like to call them the Fab Dads. These are the <laughs> uh, more casual player who wants to be competitive, but without putting in a ton of effort to learn the most uh, efficient lines possible for a complicated hero. Yeah. Yeah, so like, you know, you think about uh, you think about someone where it's like, you know, this person likes the game, they're interested in the game, but they really do not want to, you know, spend hundreds of games figuring out the like really complicated Kano play lines, uh, play lines to execute their combo. Um, or the person who does not want to spend a huge amount of time pondering like what the most efficient things to search up with, with become the Arknight are when playing Viserai. This is a very straightforward game plan, but it's also an effective one. Yeah. Yeah, this could be, if you want to compare it to Magic, comparable to, like, Mono Red Burn. Right? Mono Red Burn. Very straightforward to play. Yeah. 
It does get a little more complicated when you're on the defensive to some degree and like trying to figure out how best to use Crown of Seeds and Art of War and like activate that sort of stuff. But a lot of the time you're not really on the defensive because you sort of just roll over people, which I think we saw in the tournament stream uh, that this deck was featured on earlier. What was your what was your overall record in that tournament? Uh, it was 8-0. 8-0. Perfect, perfect bowl. Well, well done, uh, well done to you there. That was a that was a strong result. Now that's not to say none of the games were close. There were there were some that had that definitely had close elements to them. But um, overall, I think the level of aggression that this deck had was something that some people were not necessarily prepared for. So yeah, let's that's, let's talk. That's, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say yeah, that that's very true. I mean, there were there were some games that I finished within ten minutes. Um, I. I came in. The opponent had no clue what I was doing. You know, it was it was surprise. They they've never seen this list before. Um, they didn't block out the first attacks, and then all of a sudden they found themselves in a corner uh, with dominate attack after dominate attack. Yeah, when the deck really gets going, it can feel it can feel very oppressive. Um, you know, I've I've played against it with various things. I certainly don't think that it's I don't think that it's like totally ultimate and unbeatable or whatever, but. Um, you know, when I was doing when I was doing some testing earlier on, we sort of had this idea that Everfest was maybe was hopefully going to uh, slow down the format a bit with the bannings that we saw before the set came out and so on. I think Monarch was a very fast format, and then Tails also ended up being a very fast format. Um, and I personally was hoping to see um, I personally was hoping to see things slowing down a bit, and I was optimistic for that with Tails, but it didn't end up being true. And I was optimistic th about that with the Bannings and Everfest again, and we had these cool mid-range decks and stuff, but like, it, it doesn't necessarily feel like that's where you want to be right now. This uh, this type of thing to me seems like a uh, this type of thing to me seems like a strategy that is significantly scarier than some of the some of the mid-range builds that i was hoping were going to be were going to be more prevalent and the amount of aggro you can throw out there is pretty high so what is the uh matt what what is the sideboard for here so we have we have the main deck we see the like very consistent uh we see it set up to enable the the so-called captain planet ability very consistently with the earth lightning ice and only a few cards that are non-elemental, but the sideboard has a lot more non-elemental cards. What do you, what, what's your, uh, what's your plan for those? Uh, these are for the on-hit decks, Lexi, Katsu, and they're also for the Guardian decks. For the on-hit decks and the Guardian decks. Okay, yeah. I noticed um, there was one of the games that was on stream you were playing against Bravo Showstopper. You ended up winning it, of course, but it was at least kind of close. And I was curious, uh, wh what's your strategy for playing against Bravo Showstopper or one of those other builds that can itself have some very disruptive crush effects that can maybe knock cards out of your hand or otherwise break your your rhythm up a bit? Yeah, so you're you're pivoting from a uh, aggro strategy to a to a kind of a guardian strategy you're coming in with your staunches and your sink belows yeah and so then uh you've staunch got the response head. big defense reaction here uh sink below a bit of a smaller defense reaction but still really good against some on hits yeah those are for bravo's crippling crush spinal crush his yep. his big uh dominated attacks and if you do get behind, you have the uh, Awakening here to set up a big swing back. Yeah, Awakening is a super good catch-up mechanic. I mean, you only need to be a few points of life behind. You can fuse it with a Earth card and then pull out a Crippling Crush. And then if yeah. you fuse that with Bravo's ability, I mean, it, it gets nasty. It's 13 damage dominate. Yeah, and I mean, even if you, you know, even if you don't, have have as enough uh enough seismics or whatever to do a crippling crush it's actually yeah you, know, you can be behind someone by three life which is barely even behind and play an oak and old for free even if you don't have the fuse it's pretty wild the um okay so that's uh so so you're saying it, it goes to a little bit uh more of a traditional guardian plan when you're playing against other guardians would that be accurate yes yes definitely you're taking out Cards like Blink that don't do anything. Um, and you're replacing them with defense reactions and big attacks. 
Okay. Yeah, blink here. Uh, so blink is a an instant that just gives you an action point. Where where do you find this to be uh, most effective? Is that going to be a prism situation? Well, that that's a main board card. Um, I I run it into anything that I want to aggro with. Uh, okay. But, but yeah, yeah. Obviously, it's super good in the prism because of the auras. But you know, you could uh, attack with a autumn's touch blink and then swing with a hammer or come in with a uh, lightning search. Yeah, so this card is right. basically giving you a little more consistency for those hands where you might not be enabling the go again or something like that, and it can just be a, another blue pitch to fire off one of those earth attacks or whatever. Exactly, exactly. And and these no-block cards, these are going to be cards that you're going to pitch for the shield, the crown. Um, you're, you're basically turning a no-block card into... Uh, block two card or yeah block you know that block with the iron rod yeah it's actually a very it's a very interesting point there the um so it's typically you know someone might look at this card and be like oh it doesn't block that's really bad but in a deck that has this pitch based defense with the crown of seeds costing one and then the rampart costing one potentially being used multiple times plus the prospect of having null rune if you're playing into a rune blade or whatever you know you might look at this and say oh it blocks for a zero but like Actually, if you're pitching it, it's blocking for, you know, like you were saying, it can be two to four, sometimes even more, depending on how many uses you get out of Rampart, and advancing yeah. your game plan at the same time by activating that Crown of Seeds. So it's a lot less bad on defense than it might look at first glance. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so I think that's a that's a fair overview of, like, the, the main plan of the deck. So why do you think this deck is so good? Why, why has this... Uh, why has this been a, an, an early result, uh, has, has such good early results for you? Yeah, so there's three reasons why it's a good deck. So there's a win condition printed on the hero at no cost. See, uh, yep, it, being able to throw out those big dominated attacks with go again is pretty scary. Yep, dominate wins games. Uh, it can threaten lethal very fast. And yep. it has oppressive on hit effects. Yeah, let's highlight in particular Oaken Old. Oaken Old can just be a devastating card. If you get to play an Oaken Old with the Bravo Star of the Show ability and a Fusion, this is actually going to be coming in for 11 Dominate, and if it hits, the opponent has to put two random cards from their hand on the bottom of their deck in any order. That is a very scary thing to have happen, and it'll have Go Again. That could be followed up by a uh, Winter's Whale Swing or even a larger attack, depending on circumstances. Yeah, Oak and Old is the strongest card of the deck. <laughs> some would it, argue that maybe that card should have been a uh, Oldheim specialization card, and some are very surprised when they find out that it's not. But yeah, yeah just I, I was honestly with, surprised to find out that it wasn't. You know, when I when I first saw Bra Bravo Star of the Show and people were talking about Oak and Old, I'm like, oh, that's a specialization. You can't do that. Nope. It has Old him on the art, but it is not a specialization. Yeah, just a single point of damage from Oak and Old will... Uh, cause them to lose two cards and you know people will say well hey i'm gonna race the deck but you can't race the deck if if i'm high swinging oak and olds. calling these oak and olds yeah the deck can high roll in such a way that you could draw uh, all three oak and olds early on and just win the game I, yeah, and I then one that. other thing that people may not realize is this Pulse of Candle Hold, you can use this to put Earth, Lightning, and or Elemental cards on the top of your deck. So you might be in a situation where it's like, oh, it looks like the opponent's getting set up, but I have this Pulse of Candle Hold. Well, I'm going to have a guaranteed Oak and Old next turn, so, you know, here we go. So there's actually a trick with that. You, If you keep a card in Arsenal um, and you go to your turn, you can activate Bravo's ability throw the crown down, put Oak and Old on top of the deck. Oh, and, and then, then use the crown of seeds crown to draw it? To draw it, yeah. So you can throw Oak and Old the same turn after you fused with Bravo. Very interesting. See, I had I had not thought of that that uh, particular tactic, but that does seem like a way to get even more value out of this Pulse of Candle Hold. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a scary thing to have happen. And, you know, so I've played this deck. I've played against it. Um, and you know when these when an oak and old is coming at you for eleven dominate go again, it's not a very fun spot to be. Now I'm not now I'm not gonna say it's totally impossible. You know there are situations where it's like especially if you're playing chain and you have that carrion husk. You know it is possible to block it out sometimes or the big defense reaction in arsenal or whatever it is. But it is certainly a scary thing to have uh, have coming at you. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what do you think? Uh, what do you think about? What do you think about the? So, do you, first off, do you think this is the best deck in the world, or do you think this is just like one that's especially strong and easy to play? Like, how do you see this being positioned overall as uh, as the format develops? I do not think it is the best deck, but I do think that it is uh, extremely easy easy to play, and a lot of people are going to pick this deck up, and people are going to need to start building their sideboard to respond to this deck. This deck will be out there. It will be everywhere. Um, <clears throat> it's going to put up a ton of top eights, and it's probably going to win some of the uh, ProQuest events. Yeah, but okay. But it's, it's not the best deck. Yeah, I so don't you know, know if you... there is a best deck, but it's, it's But you, if you think if there is, it's not this one. Yeah. But yeah, so I would you... say I would say that this is probably S or A tier. It's it's extremely extremely strong. But it's not like some S++++ totally unbeatable has to be banned immediately type insane deck or whatever. Correct. Yeah, so you know, you hear it here first, this is not necessarily the best deck even even its own creator explicitly says this is not necessarily the best but it is a real threat and it is very accessible so you should have a plan for it if you're going to be playing in those tournaments is that would you say that's a fair summary yeah you need to start looking at throwing in cards like unmovable into your sideboard right because th this deck is going to just run over you if you cannot respond to it Another thing that I think is that um, one one thing you can potentially do against this is try to go faster than it and just have like a really fast and aggressive build yourself. This is sort of what I was talking about earlier, where I was saying that um, you know we we had these cool mid range builds that I was that, that I was hoping would be like the future of the game, but it seems like if anything, the game is becoming more aggro and stuff like this is part of it. In particular, I thought that Chain had a pretty decent matchup against this, though I'm not certain. Uh, in part because he is both really fast himself and also has a huge amount of armor, which can hopefully stave off some of that, uh, some of the punishing effects there, even potentially the Oak and Old, if you have that Carrion Husk ready to go. Yeah, the, the deck is uh, vulnerable to aggro. It's one of the things that it's weak against. Um, it could be disruptive to aggro, though, right, with the Oak and Olds. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting situation where it's like, you know, which one of us is going to be able to disrupt the other and, like, take the tempo and so on. And Oakenwald is great for that. But on the other hand, if you're playing against someone who has, you know, really nasty on hit effects that you start having to stop, if this deck has to start using a lot of cards on defense or whatever, it ends up in a pretty bad spot, both because it sort of deactivates Bravo's ability, but also just there are a lot of two-block two cards in this composition. Yeah, you, you want to get under those decks with cards like channel like frigid uh winners by blizzard yeah uh red frost thing red frost thing is a sleeper card um i like to think of it as a a mini cnc um it's going to take a card out of their hand one or two yeah. cards is going to take from their hand this is going to sound crazy, but I've actually been in situations where Frostfang Red has been better than Command & Conquer. Um, the most notable one being, if an opponent doesn't have an arsenal, Command & Conquer is just damage. But if an opponent doesn't have an arsenal, Frostfang is still threatening, hey, I'm going to take a card one way or another. And, okay, fine, there's technically extreme situations where like someone pays for it with an energy potion or whatever, but like that's not really what I'm talking about. Um it's uh it, it is it is actually a card that can be very disruptive even just the frostbite tokens from winter's whale can be disruptive and those are definitely good things to have in a situation where you're trying to disrupt the opponent one other point that i'll say about that one of the way one of the uh cards that has been most successful historically in terms of a threatening on hit effect that can make it into almost any deck is that command and conquer this deck really doesn't care very much about command and conquer does it matt yeah doesn't need command and conquer doesn't need enlightened strikes um, yeah. And if that Command and Conquer is coming your way when you're piloting this, uh, let me introduce you again to Crown of Seeds. It turns out threatening to destroy somebody's arsenal doesn't matter very much if they're planning to cycle their arsenal out anyway. Yep. Yep. With uh, $300 I just saved you from the Command and Conquers, you can go buy uh, a shield and a crown. <laughs> <laughs> and I have not. Tank, uh, so. I have not checked the prices on those items, but uh, yeah, it's it's a it's definitely interesting that the the big uh, the big threat of command and conquer is much worse here. Also, there, you know, there's some other stuff that attacks the arsenal. There's the um, 
there's the new talisman of warfare card there's also the um you know some of the classic guardian cards attack arsenal i think it's disable that puts their arsenal card on the bottom of their deck if you crush them and stuff like that you know historically could be pretty good at trying to you know prevent opponents from realizing five card hands but against this uh it's it doesn't have it doesn't have the same degree of effectiveness that it might elsewhere you know in some of those situations you can even use your find all spring tunic to pay for the crown of seeds so you didn't even have to pitch a card to do that you still got the damage reduction you still cycled it and now you have five cards in hand for the next turn it's pretty scary yeah nobody will play command and conquer into you uh when you play this deck I, I, I would I would say I think some people will play Command and Conquer against you when you play this deck and they'll be disappointed. <laughs> they, they they definitely will be, yeah. It does not take very many reps against a Crown of Seeds deck to realize, oh man, Command and Conquer is not what it used to be. Yeah, this deck wants to crown pretty much every turn. So you're you're always gonna be moving through that arsenal and seeing the next card. Okay. Yeah, that's a uh that is a classic, uh, I think that's a classic tactic The uh, with Crown of Seeds. Treacherous uh, in the chat is saying, first time chat from viewer says, are those yellow or red evergreens? Uh, so this is a blue evergreen for the pitch and then a red evergreen to come in there and hit him in the face. Yeah, so the evergreens is actually really good because these cards go back onto the bottom of the deck. So it's strong into someone who's trying to fatigue you with a bunch of unmovable soul shield whatever uh really big defense reaction so you know you can play these out a couple times yeah if you play these from arsenal put them on the bottom of the deck when the combat chain closes another thing that makes this deck kind of scary into some of these fatigue strategies is the like the blue break ground you know the blue evergreen the blue autumn's touch like, all of those are actually, you know, if you're late in the game and you've used up most of your good attacks, these are still, if you can hit your uh, your Captain Planet ability, those uh, these blue Earth attacks are still going to be coming in for 7 Dominate Go Again, which is, uh, you know, I think a much stronger endgame than a lot of aggro decks have. You know, 7 Dominate Go Again into a Hammer Swing, potentially with the Ice Effect, is uh, by no means a terrible endgame. Yeah, with a seven dominate go again from what i've seen most time it's going to be dealing um three to four damage yeah depends on depends on the situation and of course you know if your opponent has a bunch of defense reactions they can stave it off but if they spent all your de their defense reactions dealing with your big attacks that you were playing earlier you know maybe they don't have that uh the same options available to them at the end of the game that they did at the start you know people talk about fatigue decks running the opponent out of threats but in some cases, you know, the fatigue deck is also running out of its own big blocks. So there's kind of, you know, both sides are running out of ammo. And for this deck, even the uh, the Earth Blues become threatening big attacks in the late game. Yeah. So you talk about fatigue here. You'll notice that this list is slightly different than the list I ran at the tournament. At this tournament, I was a little bit worried about fatigue because I had not had reps against Oldheim and I thought maybe I might get fatigued out, and so I was running a Remembrance at the time. I've changed that because I've played against a few old times since then, and I haven't been able to get fatigued out because the, the Dominate just gets over whatever they want to throw at you. So, you know, now you'll see a Blizzard in the sideboard, and this is more for the um, go again aggro matchups, Katsu, um, the Earth briar that still exists out there yeah the um, channel man heroic style right. briar yeah so i'm just trying to combat those silly aggro decks with you know a couple tech cards yeah i know that um having played chain a bit uh blizzard can be devastating for chain because you know, if you play it and he can't pay for it or can't pay for his turn properly after he pays for it, it can not only mess up his turn, but also in some cases actually inflict a bunch of damage on him from blood debt cards that he can no longer pay for, which is a, uh, you know, it's a nasty situation for Chain to be in and can definitely be annoying for the uh, for the Shadow Runeblade players among us. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I think that's a uh, I think that's like a a, pre a pretty good overview of the uh, of the deck, Matt. Do you have any other stuff that you want to uh, you want to tell the viewers about the uh, about this new uh, elemental guardian and this style of play in general? No, 
Just get out there, have some fun, win some games. Sweet. Protect the planet, and, um, you know, whenever you hit the ability, just scream Captain Planet. Whenever you hit the ability, just scream Captain Planet. Probably don't actually scream it. It might, might be might be unsportsmanlike, but, uh, you know... Giving the uh, giving the Captain Planet name some representation there at the tournament. I, I saw you doing that on stream too. You know, Captain Planet. You slap down the three cards. You know, the opponent's morale slowly drains. <laughs> I, st- I started to get known for it. One guy was like, "Don't Captain Planet me, bro." On turn one, and, uh, <laughs> it it happened. I mean, that's that's really strong. You know, coming in with a nine dominate go again. You're you're definitely getting in some damage turn one with this deck. Yeah, you know if you if you're hitting that uh, if you're hitting that ability on turn one, you know, I don't know, maybe the opponent has red staunch response in hand or whatever, or you know something that's really able to stave off a bunch of damage. But uh, this is definitely a deck that's scary when going first. I'll say that um, it doesn't have the ability to make those seismics or whatever, but the the prospect of a big dominated attack coming in on the first turn as well as getting a head start on that tunic and getting a card into arsenal early are both uh pretty pretty legit for this build um in terms of in terms of other also also chat if you guys have any questions uh, if you if you guys have any questions or comments on the deck i would be i would be happy to hear them and we can maybe do do a little q a one of the things that i noticed um one of the things that i noticed when i was first testing this deck is it just immediately like felt powerful and it was like, man, you know, this is this is definitely doing something that is maybe better than what I was testing previously is doing. You know, I would have these like, I don't know, I, like I was playing dual wield warrior and stuff like that. And I was like, this, this can do some cool stuff. You know, I can you, these regenerating boots and stuff is going to be blocking uh, the new Valiant Dynamo. You know, we're going to be blocking very efficiently because we're making two saber swings and then, you know, the opponent comes in with that strength four on hit effect. You block with a card plus the valiant dynamo. You come back with two saber swings, recharge the valiant dynamo. Stuff like that was feeling good. But then, you know, compared to this, I was like, man, I'm getting very incremental, like small little bits of value. And meantime, this deck is coming in for like eleven dominate with horrible on hit effects, and then it comes it comes in again with the hammer. Yeah, you'll you'll break a man's spirit with this deck once you hit him with oak and old. And if you back to back oak and old them, you'll destroy them. Yeah, I had a game. I think it was last night. I had I had a game. Uh, this was a, a testing game. I hope it's. I hope that this is okay to discuss. I don't think it's any big secret. But I was actually testing against this deck, and I was in a situation where I was like, uh, I was pretty. I, I was pretty close to winning. I thought I had the advantage. Uh, I thought it was looking good, and my opponent played the pulse of uh, played the pulse of candle hold, and put the oak and old back on top of his deck. Just. Uh, so you would have it just bef- uh, before the turn that I was going to pop off. And I was just like, oh, you know, I, uh, my, my morale sank as I saw the, uh, as I saw that Oak and Old ready for next turn. Yeah. Yeah. All right. From chat, we have first time chatter, uh, YM Tony TW 199 asking, hi, what is the game plan for Prism? Okay. Yeah, so the game plan for Prism is obviously come in with your big Earth card and police their auras with either your hammer or your um, your attack action cards. Um, yeah, these lightning surges, you know, they, they can come in for zero. Like, even if you have a red lightning surge, that can break it. The blue lightning surge can break it, but you can also, of course, just pitch it to swing the hammer, which might be better. Yeah, so you can... Uh, Lightning Surge, Blink, uh, Tunic, Heaven's Claw, or Lightning Surge, Blink, Hammer, or Lightning Surge, Blink, Lightning Surge, right? You, you can, you can easily police those auras and not get ran over by them, but you need to not let the game run away from you. Yeah, if Prism gets built up, she can be really hard to deal with. Yeah. So don't so don't let it start. You know, don't ignore it. Res- respect the auras, even if you're losing four damage from the hammer. Respect the auras. Yeah. You know, you it's always interesting. You know, if, if the prism opponent is really low on life, you know, you can push for the kill. But earlier on, a lot of the time, it's going to be a better situation to uh, to try and just get stop the auras from growing out of control because prism can snowball pretty fast. 
Uh, Big Un P, first time chatter, says, could you consider Stalagmite for Briar or Warriors? So Stalagmite is that new shield. Doesn't have the reusability of the Rampart, but it does give the opponent a Frostbite token when it's used to block. Yeah, you, you definitely could. Um, this is not the end-all, be-all Bravo list. I expect that there will be more improvements coming, either from me or the community, whoever wins with this deck. Uh, the power of the Rampart, though, is your common play pattern on your opponent's turn is you're going to be pitching a blue card. So you're going to be crowning and shield every turn, right? So overall, the Rampart will probably prevent more damage, but, you know, the, the other shield could theoretically prevent more damage if you're able to give them a Frostbite, like, at a critical point. Right? Yeah. You could stop a Dorinthia Domblade swing uh, if they just have one mana left, and that could stop a counter on the Domblade. Right? So, uh, you know, it's it's tough, but the, I think the easier shield to play is probably Rampart. Um, Rampart does work really well with that strategy where you already often want to be pitching on your opponent's turn to activate the Crown of Seeds, which does mean that you're going to be able to activate that Rampart, uh, you know, quote-unquote for free, which is to say it often won't be costing you an additional card from hand. Yeah, yeah I mean, if we're going to be Fab Dad, super casual, you know, Rampart requires less thought, right? We're just <laughs> pitching and blocking with it. Yeah, you do not have to be. Uh, you do not have to be like really agonizing over. Oh man, is this, like I only get to block with this thing twice. Is this really one of my two best blocks? You're just like, nope. Just gonna throw the rampart in there. Block one. This exactly. deck does also run the arcane lantern here as a method of strengthening its arcane barrier against the infamous Kano. But that's pretty much the only matchup where you would want to run the lantern. I believe is that right, Matt? Kano only. Yeah, I. Uh... I respect Kano too much. I have a Kano player in my local meta, and um, I have another good Kano player in my testing group. Um, you know, you never know when you're going to come into Kano, so you should you should always bring in at least two or three Arcane Barrier. And what's cool about this deck is you have two Arcane Barrier plus Crown, which, you know, Crown is still going to block an Arcane damage, so it's almost like you have three Arcane Barrier for that very first attack that they throw out yeah uh okay so we have made of foam in the chat asking which cards come out for the sideboard matchups yeah that's an interesting question so like are you running over 60 or are you cutting existing cards when you're putting in some of this uh bigger stuff for those guardians and so on for the guardians you know a good guardian player once told me that uh you should be going over 60 for guardians so uh, I do. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll throw in Staunches, Crippling Crush, Awakening, uh, Sink Belows, and then I'll start taking out cards that might be weak into Guardian, like Blink. I, you know, I, I don't know if I will need Blink into them. I don't know if I will need Blizzard into them. Right? But you're not too worried at having to run an exact 60 or whatever. Yeah. Uh, Verse Guardian, where the match could go long, and I need you know, every card possible, I will go over 60. But for most decks, like let's say I'm playing against Dash, right? I'm just playing this main 60 card sideboard that you see in the Lightning, Earth, Ice, and Pulse pile. And then yeah, the not bringing, so just the main board, not bringing in the sideboard stuff for most matchups. Yeah, yeah. When do you, uh, when do you bring in the, when do you bring in the sinks? You mentioned that that's a good tactic against some of the aggro decks try to, uh, kind of block those on hits. Like, who, who are the ones that you're doing that for? Yeah, so if you think of decks like Katsu and Lexi, right, you want to be blocking the chilling ice veins and you want to be blocking the surging strikes or the whelmings. So, cards like Sink Below will, will definitely get them. Okay, and do you take other stuff out, or do you run at sixty three, or like how do you how do you handle those matchups? Uh, I I would take some cards out, yeah. To okay, I don't I don't think I would go over sixty. I I, I want the deck to be clean. I still want it to be aggro. Yeah. I, I'm not trying to go for the long game with those guys. Just for the guardians, where you think the game might go long, that's where you're over sixty. Yes, makes sense. 
And this kind of gets back to a classic principle in card games. If you're running over the minimum size, you're kind of diluting you're kind of diluting what your deck is going to do. So as an example of this, Oak and Old is a like insane card in this deck. It's incredibly good. The other cards in this deck are not as good as Oak and Old. And if you're running even like 63 or whatever, you know, you took the uh, you took your Oak and Old to normal card ratio from being, you know, Normally, you'd have uh, one Oak and Old for every 20 cards. Now you have one Oak and Old for every 21 cards. And that sounds like a small difference, and in a sense, it is a small difference. But, like, you really want to max out your chances of getting those Oak and Olds going in a lot of these situations. We see uh, in the chat, Big Un P says, Bravo took math simulation program to figure out. So I have seen some of these programs that are calculating the odds of hitting your... Uh, hitting your Captain Planet ability or whatever with Bravo Star of the Show, hitting that Earth, Ice, and Lightning. Were you using any of those programs or anything when you were designing this deck, Matt? Uh, to be honest with you, no. <laughs> I um, I think I took the deck to the tournament without even using a calculator. And, um, you know, after I ran it through a calculator, and I was like, oh, yeah, I guess it is pretty good. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, yeah, I just figured it out all in my head. But you know, those calculators were cool programming challenges for those guys, and uh, yeah, and they are they actually continue. helpful in demonstrating w how the odds vary in different situations. You know, I've seen one of them where you can enable the uh, you can enable the crown of seeds or not, and it shows, man, this is like a big increase if you're using that crown of seeds for the five card hand. Um, yeah. Fighting Walloon says, do you think LSS thought the condition of uh, Starvo, which is a common community slang term for Bravo star of the show, would be harder to meet than it is? It seems super powerful for a free ability. What do you think about that? I don't know what LSS is, is thinking a lot of the time. Um, I don't know if they thought that this ability would be hard or not. I think that was the initial community thought was it was going to be too hard so let's try to build it like bravo the showstopper and then we'll just fuse at the end of the game right but you know what why even play this deck if you're just going to fuse once or twice a game why not just play on demand dominate is that yeah. seems to be better right so if you're not building the deck around the hero ability you should probably be playing the other two guardians yeah, I personally have an attitude towards this where it strikes me that the, um, yeah, so underscore, uh, underscore CCG says, uh, quote unquote, free as in only requires whole deck to be built for it. Yeah, so it's an interesting thing. You, you do have a point where like, obviously, you know, I think a normal guardian deck is not running some of these cards for sure. Like who would put Frostfang Blue in their deck normally? But, 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 but. When you have it built like that, you're in a very different situation and you're suddenly unlocking a lot of value from some of these cards. I think that in theory, you can make a deck that has more like notional power by including more of the big guardian attacks. But what you're doing in that is losing consistency. And the consistency that you get from having these really high elemental concentrations provides a strong power level all its own. Yeah, I think these two uh, people in the chat make very good counter arguments um you know one is thinking that the deck is it fuses too often the, and the other one is seeing that hey you have to run all these really bad cards to make the deck work yeah it's, right? it's like, an we're, interesting we're situation playing blue shock striker here what competitive <laughs> deck do you see playing blue shock striker yeah this is this is not a card that i think has made it into very many decks outside of sealed play and quite frankly i don't exactly think it's a I don't exactly think it's an all-star or even in the... I, I mean limited play, but I don't think it's an all-star even in the sealed or draft formats either. Yeah. You, you, will, you will never play this card unless you are policing Prism Auras with that game plan I was talking about earlier where you're attacking with an Earth card, you're blinking, you're hitting a Shock Striker, and then you're hitting your Hammer or Lightning Search or whatever, right? Uh, but mostly that card's in there for Art of War... Um, yeah, a and pitching to play pitching an to earth throw out earth. that earth attack. Yeah, yeah. So the um, actually, Big Un P has an interesting point, suggesting that LSS might know that the uh, that this is relatively easy to meet, and for that reason, uh, Starvo is doesn't have a blitz version of the hero. I do think that 
this strategy would be extremely frustrating in blitz. It definitely would be, yeah. Yeah, imagine getting hit by Oak and Old 11 Dominate. Uh, oh, man. Going first. Like, it's, it's, it's rough. But, uh, yeah, I don't know if that's what they were thinking. I also think... Um, I, I think it's kind of an interesting, I think there's kind of an interesting trade-off, like like you were saying earlier, and like others have been pointing out in the chat, between are we going to hit the ability consistently, or are we going to be running more like overall card quality in the cards that we're playing, but at, at the cost of sig significantly reduced utility for the hero ability. And personally, I have been more impressed by this style of deck that's hitting the hero ability consistently, even if it's not like playing the best cards in the world, than I have been with the ones that have run like a bunch of normal normal guardian attacks but they only hit the hero ability very uh infrequently but you know maybe someone's going to come out with a later deck that's been really honed you know they've done all those calculations and they figured out the like exact right trade-offs to make to play more of the big attacks it's possible but at least for now i'm liking this approach more yeah all right i think that is gonna about uh oh we got another question <laughs> Okay, from a user whose name is Unban Ball Lightning, we see the question: Would Ball Lightning be good in this deck? What do you think? <laughs> yeah, Ball Lightning would have been pretty cool in this deck, right? Cause... I think, I think, I think at the very least, Blue Ball Lightning would slot in this deck extremely easily. I would much rather have Blue Ball Lightning than Blue Shock Striker. Yeah, but hey, Shock Striker blocks too. So yeah, yeah, Shock Striker blocks. Um, but yeah, so uh, yes, Ball Lightning would probably be at least somewhat good in this deck. Uh, unbanned Ball Lightning. Thank, thank you for the question. That's just that's just an amazing combination of username and question. I, uh, I, I appreciate I appreciate that a lot. That's a, a very funny moment for the stream. Uh, Kadachi for one. Thank you for following. Much appreciated. I think we are going to. Uh, about close things down if anyone has any other questions uh, about the deck feel free to ask them in the in the next uh, next few minutes but we are going to be shutting things down shortly so thank you very much to matt for uh, coming on here and explaining his deck in more detail and kind of giving a more complete breakdown of what this deck is going for um I think it's a uh, I think it's a very interesting one, and I I think with Matt's prediction, uh, this is definitely one that people might expect to see out there in the tournaments. You know, depending on how the meta evolves. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, I'll see all you fab dads out there. <laughs> all right, yeah. So shout out to the uh, shout out to the fab dads who are going to be cruising in there with this build and throwing down the huge dominate attacks without without having to memorize. You know hundreds of lines of play with Kano and Viscerai or whatever. I don't know about hundreds, but those decks are very complicated compared to this. But hey, you know, flesh and blood, you don't have to be running the most complicated strategy in the world to get results. And at least early on, this deck has been getting some pretty good results. So we will see how that goes as the season develops. But yeah, thanks again to Matt for coming on here. We will be closing down the stream relatively soon, but I'll, I will stay stay around for a few moments in case there are any final questions for the viewers. Shout out to uh, Board Gamer AV. Thank you for the follow. Much appreciated. Fighting Walloon asks, did you discuss weaknesses? Yeah, so we did discuss weaknesses earlier on in the stream a bit. Uh, is there like a quick rundown of that you could give, Matt? Uh, aggro decks can be problematic. Um, on hit decks, Lexi is super annoying to play against yeah lexi is actually lexi is actually pretty scary lexi has a not good matchup against prism i think in the common understanding but if someone figures out a lexi deck that can kill prism uh it could be very scary for some of these other builds those on hits are really punishing from lexi otk viscerai can beat this sometimes not always but sometimes yeah uh, and i have um it's it's not an unbeatable deck you know i have definitely i have played it in testing and i have won both with and against it um with various things, you know, I think that, um, I think it is, it is by no means like totally invincible or whatever, but it is a very, it is, I think a strong deck. It is one that you should be planning for. And it is something also that is going to be relatively simple for people to pick up and play, which is, which I think does mean that it has like that extra element of threat where, uh, so there's not as much, uh, not as much learning that someone might have to do. Delver guy asks maybe a faux pas, but was there a link given to test with it? 
So, I mean, these are all the cards out here on the screen, stream, and you could recreate it just based on this. This is the whole deck and the whole sideboard. But, Matt, do you have a, do you have a link we could share with the chat? I can uh, share link with the chat. Um, I sent it to you in Discord, or I can post it in the uh, Bravo. Oh, Discord. you know, I think I have it here from Discord from earlier. Can I, ju can I just uh, put that in the chat here? Yep, you can. Okay, I think this is the updated one. Uh, just put there in the chat, and yeah, obviously, you know, if you want to talk about that in the Bravo chat uh, on the main Discord or whatever, that's also cool. Uh, I don't know if it's in Bravo Discord now, but it might be soon. Um, yeah, so that this is the um, you yeah, know this is a, this is a build that uh, for some time for some time was uh, was kind of under wraps, but it's sort of out there now. So we're discussing it and. You know, you better watch out for it, quite frankly. Yeah. Go planet. All right. Yeah, Cat and go go save the planet, guys. I think that's gonna do it for this broadcast. Thanks again. Thank you very much to for Matt for uh, to Matt for coming on here and discussing the deck. Thanks to the viewers for uh, coming and checking this out. And we'll be back later with some more flesh and blood content. I will catch you guys later. <laughs>